Uh, kia ora te whanau, nau mai harumai ki tēnei hui o te pō, ko Joe Harawira taku ingoa, no whakatani a hau. My name is Joe Harawira and I'm the Injury Prevention Manager from New Zealand Rugby, uh, born and bred in Whakatani, Bay of Plenty, but based in Wellington. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here uh, this evening to facilitate this important corridor uh, of keeping uh, safe on and off the field, which builds off the, the previous webinar uh, a few weeks ago, uh, which was on creating great environments. And uh, on the panel tonight, we have a uh, star-studded crew, starting off with Dr. Danielle Salmon, uh, New Zealand Rugby's concussion expert, who's responsible for uh, developing, testing, validating uh, con concussion projects across both the community game and the professional level. Danielle works closely with the uh, World Rug with World Rugby, the New Zealand Rugby Foundation, provincial unions and super clubs. Next, we have Dr. Nathan Price, who's our culture and well-being manager. So Nathan comes with a, a wealth of experience in sport well-being, uh, both in New Zealand and Australia. And as the world, and indeed uh, Aotearoa, continues to grapple uh, with the pandemic, uh, mental and emotional well-being has become even more of a priority. And as such, the work that Nathan and uh, his team do is critical. Uh, lastly, we have Matt Peters, our game development manager for referees. So Matt brings a, an adept knowledge and understanding of the game where over the last few years, wellbeing has become a core role in the function of our referees, uh, particularly through initiatives like the Blue Card. He also offers a, another perspective in relation to not only keeping players safe on and off the field, but also how officials handle the pressure. Uh, what are some of the things that he's seeing and uh, what can we take away from this? If I can now ask the uh, panel to introduce myself, uh, introduce themselves, that'd be great. Cheers. I'll start. Kia ora everyone, Matt Peters. Um, nice to be on and just looking forward to the webinar tonight. So enjoy it and fire your questions through if you need to. Cheers. Uh, kia ora team. Uh, as I mentioned, Nathan Price, um, cultural wellbeing manager at New Zealand Rugby. Um, do a lot in the space around mental health and well-being in our community game and also our professional game so yeah happy to take any questions and look forward to having this having a yarn about how we keep uh, the game safe for everyone and keep everyone sort of mentally healthy and happy so yeah pleased to be here cool. and thanks guys um yeah no my name's danielle so i i, I work um a research scientist with new zealand rugby but my kind of focus over the last three years particularly in the community space is kind of looking at how we can better manage concussions not just from a player side, but kind of how do we work with all the stakeholders in rugby from our players through to our coaches to parents and team managers. So we've done a lot of work in that space and, you know, looking forward to sharing and um, yeah, to happy to take any questions in around um, concussions and anything that you, anything you may want to know about that area. Well, thank you for those uh, introductions team. For those of you watching, please feel free to send through any questions via the chat function and we'll do our best to answer them either throughout the webinar or at the end. Uh, this webinar is also being recorded, so for those of you that can't stay for the whole session, then um, you'll have the opportunity to watch it again later on the Rugby Toolbox. Um, lastly, although we've booked in an hour for this session, if we're done in 45 minutes, then, uh, then we're done. So uh, with that in mind, um, I'm going to frame up the session um, with a statement, really. And that statement is, what is our collective responsibility to keeping safe on and off the field. Okay, so off the back of that statement, it's about mid-season, the weather is gloomy, players might be carrying niggly injuries, finals aren't too far away. And I'm gonna start off straight away by stating that prevention is better than cure. Okay, so what does this mean for you as a coach, for example? Well, it means checking in with players and then adjusting training loads and intensities to promote recovery. Okay, there's no point in thrashing players on a Thursday night and expecting them to turn up fresh and ready to go for the game on Saturday. Chances are that chances are their bodies are, are still in recovery mode and it does nothing by way of optimizing performance. Okay, add to the mix the commitments from family, from work, from social events, niggly injuries, gloomy weather, and all, all of a sudden you've got a, a whole, whole host of, of factors that contribute to the mental and, and physical state of your players. So I just want to throw that statement over to the panel now. Okay, I'll, 
I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, look, it's it's not only players. Um, it's it's referees. There's only referees out there. It's about managing your load and. And, and also as the pressure of the, the back end of the season comes on, you know, teams vying for finals and whatnot. So, um, you know, there's those mental pressures that you have to deal with um, along with the physical things. And it's not just players. Um, certainly we, we notice a, a rise in, or an increase in injuries in our match officials at this time of year with uh, soft grounds. So Achilles, calves and whatnot, um, along with, with the mental pressures of, a long season and also increased pressure from players, coaches, spectators around um, team expectations and, and, and ensuring that referees get the decision making right. So um, it's we're asking really everybody to look after themselves, players, coaches and referees, um, managers, whoever it is that's involved in our game. Um, everybody gets fatigued at this time of year. So. Um, what, what does that look like in terms of your program? So for, for players and, and referees, your match fit. You don't need to be doing the high high workloads that that you potentially were doing pre season and early season. Your match fit. So what does that look like in terms of keeping yourselves ticking over and managing those little niggles that you may have? And so what responsibility do you coaches have around that as well for your players? Uh, referees obviously they're a bit more in, in, independent and individual on their training, but certainly it is something they should be considering if they want to see see out the season. Over. Cool. Yeah, and I guess in the in the concussion space, we, we often kind of start to see the opposite is, you know, um, in the previous years that we've done, 70% of our concussions were reported in the first half of the season. So I think potentially what we have as we get towards, you know, the semifinals, finals of the sex, we start to see an underreporting of concussions. And that's just, I think, in around the pressures of the game and, um, you know, kind of um, for players to continue playing or potentially underreport their symptoms because they don't want to be off for those that 21 or that 23 day stand down period. So I think it's really important just as team managers, players and coaches that, you know, we're aware that, you know, there is a, probably a higher level of motivation as we get towards the end of the season for players to underreport those symptoms. So it's just in around being kind of a, uh, having that awareness um, when you're looking at your teammates or looking at your players to try and keep an eye out for those symptoms and particularly around, you know, creating environments where players do feel comfortable to report their symptoms or, you know, um, reach out and say, you know, Billy's not right or Susie's not right. I think maybe somebody needs to check on her. So it's just creating a positive environment where, you know, we can look after everybody's health and safety and make sure that, you know, we're doing right by the teams and having each other's back and around that. So yeah, it's just kind of raising that awareness as well. Yeah. And then um, from a, a mental health and wellbeing perspective, as, as Joe and the others mentioned, you sort of get into this middle part of the season there's fatigue that's setting in and there's stress that goes with that. And we know the triggers for, for low mood and some poor mental well-being around injury. So if you've got players who are injured, whether it's long-term or short-term, we really need to be keeping an eye on uh, on where they're at. Um, those who also might be coming near the end of their playing day, so those who are older members of your team, if they are going to look to finish the end of the season, where are they at? And the other one is around performance. So if, if players are not performing to the the level that they expect where they put on themselves or you as a coach or their parents or their peers put on them, then that's a big trigger as well. So it's just looking at, at those sort of signs around where each individual is at. And in that middle of the season kind of wrote about trying to catch it early when it turns into, when it comes from that stress sort of base or perspective before it gets into more of that distress. So again, it's about how you as a coach or referee, whatever it might be, set up your environment to make sure you catch those things early and you're continually checking in on the well-being of your crew so we're just checking how they are you know everyone's got different things going on in their lives as we get into this part of the year we've got another um level change obviously in covid so those sorts of things just different triggers that you just need to be able to um have the courage to have those little conversations and check in um each time you're sort of with your team thanks sorry, just, oh sorry just add, add, um, um on top of what uh, danielle said uh, part of that concussion thing. So uh, we have that initiative blue card and for our match officials and, and also for players and coaches, this isn't a time to get shy on that. Um, we've got to, we got to run that process through the season. So, you know, worst case scenario, the, well, the perception of worst case scenario is one of those key players gets a head knock 
and the blue card comes out, um, we've still got to be true to that process. Um, and then that formalises what happens with that player. So it's really important that, that we do stay strong with that, uh, despite some of those inherent pressures that are around um, at the back end of the season. Over. Thanks, Matt. I think it really comes down to risk versus reward. How much risk are you prepared to take on whatever role you're in within the game versus the reward? And like when you're looking at sort of the injury data, so two thirds of the injuries that we receive in rugby are, are soft tissue. Okay, so strains and, and sprains, and they are totally preventable. You know, providing that you get the combination right between your adaptive training, better food choices, your sleep hygiene, then we can avoid many of the um, precursors that lead to stress and injury. Um, and in terms of uh, strength and conditioning, you know, having players participate in a thorough warm up and recovery session is vital to preventing injuries and to enhancing performance. And you'll find lots of really valuable resources on the rugby toolbox. Okay, so there's our small blacks and our teenage warm-ups. And even though they're for our small blacks and our teenagers, a lot of the activities in those routines are actually um, used by our teams in black, so our black ferns and our all blacks. Uh, and most recently we've um, uploaded a few drills from our all blacks scrum coach, Greg Freak, and they're really worth sort of checking out as well. Um, so these, those types of drills sort of focus on kind of functional movement patterns um, and mobility. And then if you want to take it a step further within the rugby toolbox, there's also the fitness planner, which allows you to create uh, tailored plans to your position, your, your fitness level, your age, and even um, the, the, the periodization. So in-season training plans you could potentially download. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I'm going to keep the um, it all going on. So the prevention is uh, definitely better than cure. Knowing where your players are at and how they're feeling and being able to adapt the training accordingly is important to their physical and mental well-being. And if you check out the Rugby Toolbox uh, for all the uh, resources there, that's a, uh, a very, very valuable tool for you. So we're going to change uh, tact a wee bit now. We're going to um, focus on sort of what if injury does occur, okay, and what's, what's my responsibility. And the injury we're going to focus on is concussion because it's topical. And despite the, the progress that we've made in this area, there's still a lot of work we'd need to do to, um, to keep our players safe. So all of you, if you're a coach or a referee uh, on this webinar, should have attended a Rugby Smart course by now, which does cover concussion. But every week we are continuing to hear, situa hear situations where there's a lack of clarity and responsibility. And in some cases, uh, the process is being ignored. You know, just the other week, I was um, chatting with a, a community coach who attended a Rugby Smart workshop recently, and I quizzed him on the, uh, the signs and symptoms, and he couldn't remember. And no, he wasn't concussed, but that's just an example of a, a one-touch um, educational workshop versus uh, consistent engagement throughout the season so that that knowledge becomes uh, part of our behavior. So I'd like to call on um, Danielle now to share some of her experiences and what are some of the key things that we need to know uh, about concussion? So, Danielle. Cool. So, yeah, I guess when it comes to the management of concussions, really kind of what our priorities are is that we know um, in New Zealand, uh, the majority of our concussions tend to happen in that 10 to 18 year old bracket in around sports. So it's really important with these players because their brains are still developing that we abide by kind of that four hours of concussion. So we talk about that recognize, remove, um, recover and return. So really that those are our key focus. So kind of in that we know that if a player sustained a concussion, there's some clear symptoms to look out for. And often, you know, it's disorientated. They may, may be memory loss. Um, they may be confused. Um, you may see their coordinations of suffering, or they may have um, issues with their memory, sensitivity to light or noise. You may see them holding their head, or um, you know, if there is loss of consciousness. And the key thing with that loss of consciousness is we always want to assume potentially um, that a neck injury may have happened. So if a loss of consciousness occurs, we want to go into our doctor's ABCs and ensure that we stabilize that neck and call for help until somebody comes in. So kind of recognizing those tools. And I guess what we do know in that space is that, you know, the majority of our players indicated that they wouldn't report those concussions. So 
often what we want to do is create environments where we empower everybody, you know, players, um, coaches, team managers to recognize those symptoms. So it's really important, as Joe said, you know, we do that one off education, but you know, we continually having conversations. So as a coach or a team manager, when you're doing a talk, you know, your pregame talk, talking about looking after you and other, if you see one of your players suffering or struggling with something, or there's a mood change, or they can't seem to remember a play, you know, starting to raise questions on, oh, maybe, you know, maybe Sally's not right. Maybe we need to get her off. Um, so creating environments where your players or your team feels comfortable saying, hey, uh, and really the most important thing is we do know that if we don't remove that player, potentially we put them at risk for a prolonged worse symptoms, a prolonged concussion recovery, and, you know, in the worst case, it could lead to further injury. So we need to ensure that if you recognize some of those symptoms, we get that player off. And then um, kind of that room get the player off the field. And then the recommendation is that we get them in to see a doctor in that 48, 24 to 48 hours so they can get seen, get a diagnosis, get the right information. And then they go through that recovery process so that graduated return to learn and graduated return to play, which information can be found on the Rugby Smart um, or on the toolbox in the Rugby Smart guidelines. And then they have that stand down, which is that 21 to 23 days. Um, often that is a barrier um, to players reporting concussions, but I guess the really the most important thing we need to recognize is that um, there's been research to show that you may feel fine, but we do know that using fMRI, there's still kind of microscopic changes that are going on in the brain. So despite feeling fine, often it does take up to 30 days for that brain to recover. So that's particularly for our under 19s. That's why we have that kind of three weeks stand down so they can play on week four, because you know it's really important to make sure before they go back, um, that they're fully recovered because nobody wants to have those conversations with, you know, 19 year old high school players super keen to be like, you've had six concussions, your recovery is getting worse each time. Um, you know, maybe you need to consider other life choices. And, you know, we want to ensure that everybody has the opportunity to, to enjoy um, and participate to the extent and level that they want. So it's really important to ensure that, that they're given kind of the full opportunity to recover before they go back to any sort of contact training. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, Matt, Nate, do you have any questions for Danielle? No, just more, uh, more a comment really. Um, just as a support, as I said before, um, you know, what, you know, what role, you know, how important that role of, of referees um, in in that process, and um, and look, I, I guess the other thing was we just got to be confident, uh, particularly around the blue card, is that when blue card was brought in five six years ago, it did not have an increase or a massive spike in the number of people. You know, the players were always being removed from the field by either coaches, referees, managers, whatever. All the blue card has done is create a formal process that then has to be followed once it's once it's delivered. Um, whereas before that, um, we, we players slipped through the system. So that, that's why you know, match officials have got a really important part to play here. Uh, we've always dealt with head injury, uh, but now it formalizes that process and, and then backs up the, the stuff that Danielle is talking about. So we have a really important part to play. And I, I just want to uh, reiterate that, Matt, because I guess, you know, often you look at is the blue card isn't penalizing players. This is actually giving them the opportunity to look after their health. It's an amazing thing to do. And, you know, with that, you get a free New Zealand rugby will pay for your medical clearance visit. So, you know, issuing those blue cards is a good thing because, you know, you can dig into the pockets of NZR, which is always a great thing to do. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's about giving those players and making sure that you're looking out for their welfare. And I think that's something that, you know, should be applauded and is, is amazing that, you know, referees can be a part of that journey to ensure that players are being looked after. And, and I think that that's a key thing to understand is you're, you're not penalizing players, you're looking after their health and safety, which is, you know, we all have to do. So that's, that's awesome. Thanks, Danielle. And again, I'd just like to refer everyone to the Rugby Toolbox again, where you can click on a number of tackle skills and drills. 
that you can take your team and your, and your players through. Uh, for younger players, there's tackle clinics that's um, for our small blacks and they're run through your provincial unions. So feel free to get in touch with them. Um, but Matt, I'd, I'd like to call on a, a bit of uh, your experience here, mate, uh, particularly around, you know, we're seeing like a lot of uh, club rug rugby um, coaches and teams trying to mirror uh, performances from the professional game. And can you tell us, mate, like, is, is there a lot of difference between the professional game and the community game? Well, there is in terms of, um, you know, training, uh, speed, power, weight, the, the bodies, the collisions are bigger. Um, and, yeah, it, it makes sense, particularly as you ramp up. So Premier Club, um, the, you see a lot of mirroring there, et cetera. But one of the things, and everyone will be aware of on the call, hopefully, that over the last couple of years, World Rugby's brought in a number of um, priority areas, which are designed specifically uh to create safety or, or, or enhance safety on the field, as well as uh, get a genuine return on, on the shape of the game, uh, positive shape of the game. So um, if you've been watching Super Rugby, for example, this year, you'll notice a number of those. And so what we've, what we've eliminated, for example, is, a lot of, is, is the side entry, people running past breakdowns, taking out players off the ball to create, create low pressure zones where people can then run through with the ball and so on. So um, that's all been tidied up. So a lot of those potentially what we could refer to as illegal collisions, mm. they've gone. Um, so as a result of that, that's now been rolled out in, in club rugby. So even if we've got some, some marine of, of what we've seen in the high performance sector of our game, even though we get some of that in, in, in community rugby, um, as long as these priorities are applied, um, we, we are we are seeing a safer game. In actual fact, our injury rates are down as a result of that. So it's a really, really important piece of work. It has been driven by World Rugby. And in fact, these priority areas, they have been driven by coaches, coaches and players. So the likes of Conrad Smith, Dave Rennie, um, Joe Smith, those people, they've been involved in this, in this area. So the majority of the people pushing it come from that coaching playing area. So it's really important that we all, all recognise that this isn't a law thing, particularly when it's not a referee-driven thing. It's a game-driven thing. What is the best thing for our game? Um, so until these priorities came in, where we had community rugby copying super rugby, for example, and test rugby, yeah, that was dangerous because a lot of what we were seeing in, those, in that, that area of the game was illegal, was high impact, and it was dangerous for our players. With the implementation of the priority areas, um, we've seen a distinct improvement in terms of safety and the shape of the game. Um, two years in, uh, the exciting thing is we've made some massive shifts. What's it going to look like in, in another 12 months or another 24 months? Because this isn't going to go away. World Rugby has seen the results of this yeah. um, and they like what they're seeing. Cool. Over. And I guess there's the one other thing um, that we do know in the community space, particularly in the women's game, is that there's quite a difference between, um, I guess, the mechanism of injury for kind of what we see at the professional space in, in the women's versus what we see at the community space. So particularly in that women's space is we see at the community level a lot more impacts with girls with their heads on the ground. And a lot of that comes down to potentially um, their rugby playing experience. We know in New Zealand that uh, often our women start at, at high school age, whereas, you know, where, where the men tend to start earlier. So they haven't had that skill development. So often what we do see when they go into contact, they've got poor body positions. So often when that tackle does happen, there's a lot of contact that's happening with their heads on the ground. So this has been done looking at um, mouth guard studies and head impact capture data out of the UK. So we'd expect probably we see similar things here in New Zealand. And I guess that's something that we're working at, looking at at the moment with this head impact study that we're doing down in Dunedin. But that's just something to be aware. And I think building on what Matt said is, you know, particularly in that community space, a focus on having good body position particularly for your women and coaching that so that they know how to fall. And um, when they do go into contact, they've got that proper body position. Yeah, can, I, can I just jump on the back of that too? So if you look at your, your, your average training at, at you know, most level secondary school and up, 
there's a lot of effort goes into tackle training, the tackler. Very little is talked about in action through what is the what is the person that's been tackled? You know, what are their actions once they're tackled? You know, how what are the safe ways to fall, to land, and so on. So that's a real opportunity for for our coaches, um, with our players to actually actually you know tick that tick that part of it. You've got a ball carrier and you've got a tackler when it comes to the tackle. So a lot of effort into the tackler. We need more effort into um, what that ball carrier is doing once they once they are going to ground. Um, and uh, Danielle's right. Um, seems that that women in particular at the moment, um, they they once they're heading towards the ground, that just the, the head can often hit the ground. We don't see it as much in men. Thanks, guys. There's some really great points. Um, just like to add to to what Matt was saying around kind of the tackle and even Danielle. So like. What I'm seeing is like um, in, in terms of mirroring is is players trying to affect a, a dominant tackle, which is what we consistently see kind of at the professional level. When in actual fact, if you're going to uh, adopt the the safest way to tackle to to reduce your chance of injury, it would be more of the the passive tackle. So going with the momentum as opposed to to going against it. And certainly most of the the moderate to the more moderate to serious injuries that we see coming through uh, rugby um, tend to happen at that uh, at that collision, both between uh, the tackler uh, and the um, person being tackled. Um, ultimately, though, we, we don't expect all of you to be a, a Dr. Danielle Salmon, so you don't need to know everything. Fortunately, you can go to the rugby toolbox. And if you're a, if you're a coach out there, probably the main one for you is around uh, recognizing and, and removing your players uh, from the yeah. field. Cool. And they're also for any, if you want to share, if you pop onto the toolbox, we have um, kind of five to six minute online modules where you can go as a referee. We've got some for referees um, in around that blue card and how to recognize concussions. We've got some for coaches, which talk about that recognize, remove, um, particularly for our female, those coaching female athletes. We know often there's less support from a medical standpoint. So really highlighting the importance of knowing the steps to go through for that return to play. Um, and there's also a modules there that you can share with your players or you know um, a parent's module as well often um, we know there's challenges with parents on how to recognize or parents wanting more information so you feel free to share those resources via the toolbox or um yeah cool thank you danielle all right we're going to move along now to focus on um, safety off the field in relation to to mental well-being and as mentioned globally it's, it's a massive issue and it's getting bigger and over the last four years, New Zealand Rugby has rolled out headfirst our mental fitness resource. So I'd like to ask uh, Nathan to tell our, um, our viewers, uh, what is headfirst, mate? Yeah, thanks, Joe. So headfirst is a, a program we started about four years ago, as Joe mentioned, which really is for rugby and by rugby. Um, and it's to help individuals as well as communities um, support their own well-being, their own mental health, as well as the well-being of those around them. So whether it's in their game, whether it's those who they're coaching, whether it's a refereeing network, uh, whatever it might be. So that sort of manifests in a number of ways. We've got a, a website, headfirst.co.nz, which has all the resources around sort of signs and symptoms. It's got uh, videos from players. Uh, there's a section on there for coaches as well, which has Wayne Smith uh, and Darren Whit come in, talking about how to set up an environment that's conducive to having um, great wellbeing. How do you check in on your players? How does the environment actually contribute um, or have protective factors for, for wellbeing? Because the reality is with um, with rugby is that we work with a really high risk group eh, in terms of their mental health and well-being, so which is uh, mostly males, um, and then it is uh, mostly people under 25, and we know that about 75% of mental health and well-being programs, uh, uh, sorry, programs uh, issues start uh, before the age of 25, and high rates of Maori and Pacifica who are also overrepresented in um, in our uh, mental health statistics across New Zealand. So there's a real um, there's real need here in rugby, and we've got a real, a really great opportunity to support the community um, and and the mental health and well-being of, of players and coaches, etc. So, so what we do is, as we go to community clubs, and we'll present a sort of a 90-minute workshop as one option. As I said, we've got the website. There's a um, an online module now that's just been released specifically for coaches, which is about how to support players in their environment. So that's in the um, in the New Zealand Rugby LMS as well. So that's really um, really valuable resource. So effectively what we head first is, is, is just there as a support system and mechanism to say, actually, we want to increase the literacy around mental health and wellbeing. As Danielle mentioned about concussion in terms of 
been able to spot the signs and the symptoms that they're really the same as for the for mental health and well-being. Um, we don't expect people to be experts, but it's awesome if you can recognise actually what's happening in a player or in a, in a mate or uh, someone in your whānau um, and what those signs are in terms of are they withdrawn, um, is their mood low, are they showing more anger, are they drinking more, um, what's their hygiene um, like, what sort of things they say and how they're behaving, behaving. So any of those things that are sort of out of the ordinary really should be a trigger for the, for the coaches or um, referees, et cetera, whoever it might be that's closest to ask those questions. I think the, the important thing for, for all of us in a sense is that we know that at any one time, um, one in five of us will be struggling with our mental health. And that means for the, the four of us who, who aren't, then we've got an awesome opportunity to actually check in on each other and sort of see, you know, where the support is needed. So that's, um, that's really important. So our role really is to encourage everyone to create an environment that actually supports that, uh, the conversation around mental health, reduces that stigma. Um, recognize those signs and symptoms and how to have a conversation about that. So that's really what we're, what we're about. And so we're, we're here to take any sort of questions, help with support, come out to clubs, run some, some, uh, some workshops um, and help you in a sense to help, help your players. That's, um, that's massive. Thanks, Nathan. When I think about some of the issues around vulnerability and how many of our young men just won't speak up, um, which, which plays really well into uh, the last webinar around sort of creating a great environment and you want to ensure that your environment has elements of where they feel as though they, they belong and then they feel safe. So that might mean you as a, as a coach or as a referee opening up a wee bit and showing a bit of vulnerability, your vulnerability yourself so that they can yeah. feel as though they can approach you. Totally. I mean, in, in a sense, the coach is, a, is a such a key role model here. And in some cases, you know, you will see uh, the player more than the player will see their friends um, in some instances, uh, like, you know, that two or three times a week. So you'll be the one who might notice that difference. Um, so they'll look for you um, to see what you're role modeling. And if you're role modeling an environment where you're saying, hey, we're going to check in on our, on our, on our mates and um, that's what this team stands for, then that, that sort of opens that door to say, actually, okay, this is a safe space for me to put my hand up and say, I'm not doing so well at the moment or, or I don't, you know, I need to get some help. Um, and so that is, yeah, I totally agree, Joe, mate. That that role modeling is is, is um, such an important part of, of how you create an environment that is conducive to people saying that they need to get some help. And and then then you know for the coaches and and whoever kind of knowing where their help is. So that that is things like the one seven three seven number, uh, which is twenty four seven. Places like Head First website we can go and just get connected up to to any of their help as well. The GP, um, all those areas. Um, straight away will be able to help support anyone. Mate, mate just on that, what, what kind of things have you heard from, um, have you heard coaches talk about in relation to their roles? Um, yeah. Towards mental health. Uh, the feedback we've had from coaches, so, so as an example, we're just at um, Te Puna, uh, down in, uh, up in Tauranga last week, and we had coaches talk to us about that they're worried about saying the wrong thing, so that if a player is visibly struggling or they've had really low mood, they don't, they're worried to ask because they don't know then how to have the conversation. And if it comes back to them that, yes, coach, I've been, I am struggling with something, you know, they don't know quite what to say. So coaches feel like maybe they're apprehensive, there's an apprehension there, or they don't want to trigger something, or if they drop the player, is that going to be an issue? So the, I mean, the key thing to remember is you don't have to know exactly what to say. Nine times out of 10, you just need to listen. You need to ask if they're okay. You need to listen. You need to encourage them to seek support or help them to do that. And you need to check back in. So those are the, those are sort of things that that as a coach or a referee or someone who's who's having a disclosure, someone's disclosing where they're at, is it's the it's called the ALEC model, A L E C. So ask, and if, if you're asking, tell them what they, you've noticed. So if you say, if I use you, Joe, for example, you might say, Oh, Joe, I noticed that you know you missed a couple of trainings, or you don't see yourself, or you're a little bit lashing out and at training. You know, so it shows that you that we've noticed we're listening. And then the L is, is listen. So when Joe responds, really listen without judgment and say, you know, like, holy Joe, you're crazy. You know, we really want to try and drop drop that uh, right down. Uh, and then the E for encourage, encourage them to seek support, help them understand where that, that support might be. And then there's a check back in. And the key thing about the check back in is you don't just say to Joe, all right, Joe, well, you know, come and see me if you need me, because that puts that onus back on Joe to then have to have another courageous conversation. So take it upon yourself to go, I'm going to check in Joe with you again. Uh, on Thursday's training, just to see how the last couple of days have been, mate, and if there's anything else we need to do. So, if, you know, you're unlikely to say the wrong thing, 
uh, if you follow that that kind of general rule. And like I say, just on the headfirst side, it's got that all laid out and it's got a little bit of a script for coaches about how they can approach those conversations. So that's the key thing we hear is with people are just worried about how to have those conversations. Nathan, if I can just ask too, you know, at the moment, well, every year really, it's, it is a topic of conversation where sidelines can get a bit uh, There's a bit of pressure out there and, and, you know, worst case scenario, our match officials can experience uh, that threshold of abuse. Um, this would be a good a good thing to potentially have have, have there for them uh, or th them to be aware of um, if they are feeling a bit, bit dented after a you know a game where they've had a bit of a torrid time. Yeah. Yep, hundred percent. And and there's a there's a spot on there with uh, with referees. We've got um, former referee Chris Pollock on on the site talking about how he dealt with some of those those pressures as well. But for a, a referee, you know, there's that if they come off the back of a game, for example, it's like how are you kind of um, brushing all that off? What are you going to, what are your strategies to keep yourself well? And because it's not all about that deficit of um, poor mental health, it's about how do we keep ourselves mentally fit, which actually builds our resilience. And you can kind of roll with those those things that life throws at you. And that might be things around practicing mindfulness and meditation. It's a great way um, to then sort of to reset your mind. Uh, practicing gratitude as well like what do you you know three things a day what are you grateful for again it shifts your mindset from focusing on the negative or what that that pressure that might have come in the game as you talk about mad or the abuse in terms of what, what went well today so your brain can start scanning for that positive and again shift your mood so those couple of things uh, are really useful and what are you doing away from from that sport so sort of that really sort of fills your cup like what brings you joy still um was it going for a run the dogs or surfing fishing tramping whatever it might be that actually really still gives you that that lift and that boost and how are you doing that on a weekly basis to help build your resilience as well. So there's a few things there that are really important for referees because it is a, a, a totally different environment where for a very really intense and like you say, they do come under a fair bit of scrutiny. So totally agree. Thanks, Dan. I think one of the interesting things for me is um, how everything is so interconnected. So like if you if you have if you have a proper nutrition if you're sleeping well, if you're training well, if you're keeping everything in balance, then naturally that has an impact on your uh, on your mental and emotional well-being. And then when you um, suffer a setback, like an, an injury and the likes, then the impact of that of that setback, if all those other things are in check, isn't as significant. Um, but it's it's something that you need to keep working on. It's not something that you can do as a one-off. It, it becomes it has to become a routine. It has to become habitual. Totally, it's just like our physical fitness, mental fitness is no different. You got to you got to train it, you've got to work on it. Otherwise, when when it comes, you know, you know, this snaps. So it's really is like that muscle that you need to keep stretching, mate. Yeah, so um, hundred percent always working on on your mental game as well, and um, whether it's your spirituality or your um, social connections, whatever it might be, all those things are, are great protective factors. Right, oh, Fano, how was that? Forty minutes. Uh, thank you very much uh, for taking the time to hear from the, the panel tonight. We hope that you'll um, take away some key messages that contribute towards keeping um, players and everyone really safe on and off the field. Ultimately, though, uh, my main takeaway from this is that we all have a role to play. And if we each do our part, then we'll see more players and more of our community have a quality experience that leads to a lifelong love of the game. Uh, just if there's no further chat, I... Um, I think it's quite fitting that we, we close out the webinar with a whakatauki or a Māori proverb. And so the whakatauki uh, motipo for tonight is nā tauraurau, nā takuraurau, kaore ai tiwi e, which basically means through our collective efforts, uh, the people and the community will thrive. So thank you very much for, for your time, everyone. Thank you to the panel uh, for joining us tonight and um, go well. Kia ora. Kia ora.